I'm a feminist, but I'm quite glad International Women's Day is only a day because, frankly, it's really tense and I'm exhausted already. I don't know how men do it all the time. How do they have all of the other days and sleep? I'm a feminist, but uh, when I called my garage to book my car in for a service and the guy on the other end of the line called me sir, I didn't correct him. Are you going to get better service? It's Joe Brand, everybody. <laughs> it's a real treat. I thought I might. <laughs> yeah, you'll get better service and he'll take what you're saying more seriously. I'm a feminist, but last night I had a Bridgerton It's a Sin crossover sex dream and it wasn't. That dream wasn't feminist. I am. It mm -hmm. wasn't. And I'm a feminist uh, and I didn't say anything at a charity event when a very pissed bloke stuck his tongue in my mouth because I didn't want to cause a fuss at a big charity event. That's a weird thing to oh, do, wow. I know, but oh, it was it was quite a few years ago, and I really uh, was torn because he said, "Here, give me two hundred quid for the charity if you can just give me a kiss on the cheek," and then he just pulled my face round and went, Bleh. and it was really disgusting. Oh, uh, but there were like so oh many people there, wow. pathetic. Wow. I know. But was there an audience, Joe, for this? Did you other people see it? Well. There wasn't a formal audience, <laughs> but um, there was. There, there were a few you know, the people, people there. They didn't I think it's down to other people to complain about that. That's very tricky. I hope the charity frankly appreciates that. Was that before me too? I bet it was. Was it before uh, oh, me it too? Oh, it was long before like, that. Yeah, long before that. Yeah, me too has made men too scared to do that kind of thing. Um, at least, in public, at least to people of influence. At least in that way, it's worked. I'm not saying it's got rid of everything, but I'm saying it has frightened some of the worst ones from doing the absolute worst things so blatantly. Yeah. And I think bless right. me too for that. Um, <laughs> I'm a feminist, but sometimes I agree with other feminists because they like me. Oh. I feel I might do that tonight because our guests are so very clever. And I'm so impressed <laughs> by women who know about science and medicine. I'm overly impressed, but I'm also not overly. I should be impressed. Look what happens <laughs> when medicine goes wrong. Look around. I'm stuck at home. I've got no audience. Live, <laughs> you're all out there. I'm all aware you're out there. Thank you. Thank you. We need you. We're comedians. We need your love. I'm a feminist, but I don't uh, correct my brother when he calls women ladies um, because he's such a nice person, but it does absolutely drive me mental. I don't know why I just hate yeah. the word, you know, do come in, ladies. You know, I'm not a lady. I haven't yeah. got a crinoline on and I don't drink my tea in a feminine uh, way. Stop calling me that. Do you know what? I'm a feminist, but I think I get annoyed by men saying ladies. If I was on a girls' night out, and I'm yeah, I'm using girls here, but I was on a girls' night out and one of my friends went, all right, ladies, we're off to the next pub or whatever. I'd be fine with it. But if a man said, oh, ladies, do come in, I'd be like, no, <laughs> absolutely see, not. No, My double standard. Well, it's not really because the difference there is the way that you said it, and I'm very familiar with that, there's a sense of irony about it when women say it to their friends. It's like, come on, ladies, isn't it? But men uh, don't, don't do that. That's and true. that's why it makes it very annoying. Well, also, they don't own it. I think if you don't own it, don't use it. Those things for me are only plurals. I would never say, oh, ask the lady in the shop, because I would think, oh, that's mm. diminutive. I would say, ask the woman. And I would certainly never say, ask the girl in the shop, unless she was, you know, five. Um, <laughs> but I would say, girls, <laughs> girls night out, or all right, ladies, another round of drinks. Because you're right, the way I said that then, there's a touch of irony to it, isn't there? The thing I really don't like is shall I be mother when someone's pouring the tea? I'm like, um, even if they're a mother, that's out, it's right <laughs> out for me, dead to me, absolutely dead to me. The Guilty Feminist. Yes, we are back, back to where we once belonged to the Science Museum for International Women's Day. And here with me is my exceptional co-pilot, Joe Brand. Woo! Hello. Joe, I'm 
so yeah. excited. You're 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 co-hosting the Guilty Feminist. Um, I've wanted this for a long time. I don't know what I'm going to get for my other two wishes because uh, that was the first one I asked the genie for, and there you were uh, immediately. And uh, we've asked you because you're one of the best comedians in this country. And also, we were especially excited to get you for this episode because we're at the Science Museum and our theme is women in medicine. You are one of the only comedians I know who has been in medicine. You were a nurse, which I think is one of the most extraordinary jobs that there is. And uh, I read today on the BBC uh, News website that nurses, after all they've been through with COVID, you know, you've seen their faces, you know, bruised from the PPE, and we know that they're paid so little and they do so much. They've been offered a 1% pay rise. Can you imagine? What's the incentive for anyone to be a nurse? Absolutely awful. Well, um, there isn't really any incentive financially at all, because I think um, it was a very low barrier And so if you put 1% on, they'll still be getting paid next to nothing um, compared to what they're worth. Mm. So um, the problem with that is, is that people say, oh, it's a vocation. So it's all right for us to give you rubbish money and treat you badly, you know, because you love it so much that whatever we do to you, it doesn't really matter. And also, I have to say this, and I'm sure everyone's thinking it. Uh, because the majority of nurses are women, it's kind of easier to do it to them, uh, you know. And at one point, um, as we move forward, it won't be easy to do that anymore. But it still is slightly easy at the moment, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think that's a shocking shame for the ladies. Sorry. <laughs> the ladies. Um, <laughs> we did an episode and then I did a TV pilot where I dug into this more deeply a lot of people are going out of nursing now. And it's not really to do with the money, although the money is shocking. And a lot of nurses have been going to food banks, which is just a disgrace to this country, in my opinion. I shadowed a nurse for a day, and that was really helpful because I understood it, that doctors might come down and go, this needs to be done, this person needs this, this person needs that. But the nurse's role is to be the humanity and do things in a caring way and engage with that person and see what they need. And because there are so many fewer nurses now, for all sorts of uh, reasons that need not be. Um, They're not doing the part of their job, which is the vocation anymore. They're not allowed to because they've got to run so people don't die and sort of dispense pills very quickly and whatever else needs to be done. And they don't get to do the bit that is the vocation. You know, they were describing saying, you know, even giving someone a good death, making sure they're looked after and their family's called or, or you sit with them if the family's not available or whatever. It's not, it's, they're overrun. And therefore that part of, a nurse, which is, I think, much more heightened than that of a you know a person who may be in another profession, is actually being squeezed because where as someone else might be able to just dispense the medicine and walk on, someone who has a vocation to be a nurse is so desperate to engage and connect on a personal level, and the time means that they're they're not being able to do that. Is that something you remember and you experienced? Well, yeah, but I think things have really changed since I was a nurse. I mean, one thing that happened when I was a nurse was they brought in something called the nursing process. And what that was was an attempt to try and get nurses to humanise, particularly general nurses, not so much psychiatric nurses, but to get general nurses to humanise patients a bit more because they got to the point where sometimes they were so busy, they'd sort of go, oh, have you given dinner to the liver in bed nine? You know, and that person would just be purely an illness rather than a whole individual with a personality and everything. So they made a big effort to sort of change that. And then not that much longer afterwards, nurses began to have to have a degree to become a nurse. Now, before that happened, you had two grades of nurses. You had, let's say, let's stick to general nursing, SRNs and SENs. And SENs had slightly less time to train. And uh, they had a two-year training, and I think SRNs had three years. But also, they were kind of expected to do the sort of less glamorous jobs. So they did the kind of cleaning up, you know, the changing beds and everything. And the kind of SRNs got on with the slightly kind of more, um, you know, challenging stuff. But SENs kind of got 
were got rid of and replaced with what we used to call nursing assistants, but are called healthcare assistants. And so um, what you have these days is all nurses have degrees. And so to some extent, they're vastly underused because they know much more than sometimes they're called upon to do. And I have to say, when I was a nurse in the walk-in 24-hour psychiatric emergency clinic, and this is not kind of boasting or anything, but we basically trained the junior doctors how to work in acute psychiatry because they would get there wet behind the ears, say the most appallingly kind of inappropriate things to patients. And we would have to kind of get them out of the room and go, don't do that or someone's going to hit you or no, you don't need to give them 1500 milligrams of that. You might kill them if you do that. So, you know, in some ways it was frustrating. Oh, it was like scrubs, you know, the sitcom scrubs. That, yeah. that happened in that where the nurse, I remember once the nurse Roberts, who was very dry, said to a doctor, this junior doctor just told uh, me to give that patient X milligrams of this drug. But I thought I'd check with you before I kill the man. <laughs> no, I just, it's just such a great line. It's just like, it's going to kill him. So I guess I'm going to have to talk to another doctor because I know, you know. And you did a brilliant show called Getting On, which was of your experience of being a nurse. Yes, absolutely. And, um, I, I, you know, that was it was, a, it was kind of a lovely show to do. And I think... I hoped what it brought out was just the very different things, different types of personalities contribute, you know, in a hospital setting. And I just want to kind of also quickly go on and say, it's not always the case that nurses are constantly superior to doctors. It, that's not, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying we're sort of used early on in doctors' careers to sort of, you, you know, cause it's kind of bolster things a bit, I suppose. And then they go on to the heady heights of whichever specialism they they alight upon and um, and kind of nurses say where they are. But then, at that point, you started introducing kind of specialist nurses as well, clinical nurse specialists, and they kind of are sort of on a par with junior doctors in terms of their knowledge or their prescribing ability or whatever it may be. So it's all kind of quite complicated in a way, I think, and I don't think they've really yeah, sorted out where it's going to go. So if you're watching at home, hashtag not all doctors, hashtag not all nurses. Now, I've, I'm sure a lot of doctors and nurses have tuned in tonight because it's the Women in Medicine special. Joe's speaking from her own experience about one small thing. Don't throw things at the screen and uh, tweet the Science Museum. We get it. We get it. It's complicated and big. But I think that uh, the point is sometimes nurses are underappreciated. I haven't been a nurse for 35 years. So I virtually worked at Scutari. So don't take anything I say as red as applying to the present day, um, you know. And so don't get angry because of what I've said, because, I mean, it's very, very different now. And I know kind of the huge pressure uh, nurses are under now in a very different way. But I'm kind of just giving a, a retrospective uh, tiptoe through the history of nursing there. Listen, later, we, uh, one of our guests is Florence Nightingale. So uh, she'll, she'll <laughs> be able to reminisce. <laughs> Yay! Um, what was the funniest scene to make in Getting On? For me, I have to say that the scenes that I loved the most were the ones with Ricky Grover in because he played this hugely pompous uh, male nurse who didn't really know anything. And so anything with him in and us trying to kind of bat him away from doing something utterly ridiculous. And that the scenes I liked the best were the ones that we lifted from our various moles in different hospitals. Like we, we had a kind of life-size cardboard uh, statue of the head of the hospital. And when people walked past it, it would go, now wash your hands, please. And that would always make me mm -hmm. laugh. But actually, that was given to me by a friend of mine. And she said they actually did have that in their hospital. And, no. you know, it's so surreal how, you know. That statue was ahead of its time, that. Joe. That statue was ahead of its time. We all need one of those in our house now. We're all obsessed with washing our hands now for 14 happy birthdays. But, you know, on the other side of this, the happy birthday song is going to trigger me. As I'm telling you. When I hear that at a party, I'm going to start wanting to wash my hands. And it's not going to help that someone's then going to spit all over a birthday cake and ask me to eat a piece. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone out 
there in Science Museum land who's tuned in. I think there's about a thousand of you. Thank you so very much. Would you like uh, to hear some comedy from Joe Brand? Yes, of course you would. So please welcome to the mic, the exceptional Joe Brand. Woo! Well, th thank you very much. I, I'm not do going to do uh, comedy in the traditional sense, but I am going to just lift a few um, little incidences from uh, my comedy career and my nursing career. Um, uh, because it's International uh, Women's Day, I think it's kind of important just to kind of look back at, at, you know, at a few times when, let's say, maybe some people were, were less than uh, subtle. Uh, and I'm going to start okay. with taking my own daughter when she was about six with my best friend to A&E because she's got a very swollen eye. And uh, my best friend at the time, she's five years younger than me, but she just happened to have prematurely grey hair. And um, a junior doctor came in who obviously looked about 14 because they did when, you know, they do when you get older. And um, he turned to me and uh, started... Uh, explaining what was going on with my daughter and uh, then he turned to my best friend five years younger than me and went and what does Nan think and um, oh. <laughs> I, oh. I can't really say what Nan thought because it was extremely uh -uh. rude and she voiced it and um, that to me really says something about the attitude towards women who have grey hair it doesn't matter if you're 23 mm. if your hair's grey People think you're 70. It's so weird. Uh, anyway, um, so that kicked it off. Also, um, one thing that I did a lot of when I started comedy was I comped gigs, which means you kind of host them. And what that allows you to do is sort of relax a bit and um, be comfortable with kind of talking to the audience. And it is actually really hard work because the whole sort of structure and mood of the evening is in your hands. And I think compares work really really hard so I'd done a big show at a club called the Red Rose in Finsbury Park and um, it had gone very well and I'd probably done twice the amount of material or maybe three times that the actual stand-up comics had done that I was introducing anyway I came off stage and I felt quite pleased with myself and um, a man who'd been to the show came up to me and he said um, do you actually do anything else while you're here and I said well, well, like, what do you mean? And he said, well, do, do you have to kind of clear up and wash the glasses and sweep the floor? <laughs> I was like, no, I'm the compare, for God's sake. But because I was a woman, he just assumed that somehow I'd come on and just somehow done that. And then I was responsible for all the housework afterwards. Totally bizarre. Moving back to nursing for a little bit, we had a police cadet when I first trained as a student uh, working on the ward with us. He was a little bit wet behind the ears and we all used to be on an emergency bleep. And when that went off, it would normally be a violent incident. So you phoned a number and you had to run as fast as you could to a ward where said incident would be. We got the call one day and he actually arrived first at the ward and um, there was a woman kind of like waving her arms around and screaming and, and generally kind of making a huge fuss. Uh, he was on his own, so he just leapt on top of her, threw her on the floor face down and sat on top of her with her arms pinned to her back. And that woman was senior sister Mullet, who was in charge of the ward. So um, that was oh. <laughs> quite an interesting uh -huh. day. She was not happy, as you can imagine. But um, there we go. Bless her. Uh, so uh, I also just have to say one thing that as a nurse, I was really bad. I was a degree nurse. I was one of the first degree nurses in the country very early on. And we were felt to be so intelligent because we were doing degrees that we didn't actually, as psychiatric nurses, have to do a general three-month nurse training. So the only training that we got was in the School of Nursing and we were taught to inject oranges and we never actually did anything to a human being until we were let loose on the wards. So consequently, I was absolutely useless at every um, physical procedure that I had to do. And I remember once injecting this poor woman like really, really badly and saying, oh, yeah, OK, um, uh, I'll just have another go. And after about 10 minutes, she turned to me and went, can I have a tablet, please? 
I felt so <laughs> bad about that. And so I used to be a coward and get other people um, to go and do it. And I was also, I was also kind of quite um, uh, sort of wimpish as a nurse. I wasn't kind of terribly keen on kind of physical procedures either. And I once chaperoned a junior doctor who was doing a lumbar puncture on someone, uh, which means drawing some cerebral spinal fluid from the bottom of the spine. You have to get the patient in a particular position. It's quite tricky. Well, I had two goes at my injection. He had nine goes at this, right? And it was a boiling hot August day. This poor woman comes looking longingly at me like a kind of wounded animal. Um, and I didn't do this deliberately, but he knelt down and went, I'll just have one more go. And I fainted um, on top of him, knocked him to the floor. And I think I probably hurt him quite badly. And um, the patient sat up on the bed and went, oh, thank you, nurse. Thank you. And that was like the <laughs> best thank you I think I ever got um, as a nurse. Back to me briefly. When I gave birth to my first child, uh, I was in the process of it. And uh, somebody came on to the labour suite with an autograph book and asked for my autograph, which was probably one of the most surreal things that's ever happened to me. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, and it, that was a doctor from the other, another part of the hospital. Um, and actually during that, in fact, that whole episode was very odd. Um, I was in a hospital for a couple of days and at one point I was getting kind of like a pain killing injection. And I have to say, and this midwife that did it, did it really badly and it really hurt. And I kind of swore really loudly and she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Can I kiss it better? Ooh. Now... <laughs> Which nursing manual is that in, I want to know. What a bizarre <laughs> exchange that was. It was so weird. It was so weird. And um, uh, finally, uh, one more comedy story. When you start to tour, you all know this, Deborah. you go from a and b which is like grim as anything, and suddenly you find yourself mm. staying in quite nice hotels. Well, I was staying mm. in a very nice hotel in Manchester, and I didn't actually... Uh, have a suitcase with me. I just had my stuff in a Tesco's bag. And I went up to the counter and said, oh, there's a room booked for me. And she called security. <laughs> she thought I was at home. <gasps> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I, I think we managed to convince her I wasn't eventually. But obviously, I must have looked the part. Uh, and finally, I think one thing we must not forget uh, uh, about nurses is that they do suffer a degree, I think n much less these days, but a degree of harassment. I did about four weeks of nights when I finished my training with a male nurse who uh, basically was trying to chat me up for four weeks. And it was like quite stressful, to be honest. And on the final night when he knew it was his last chance, um, I think he'd had a couple of drinks as well. He sort of leaned across to me. We were both sitting on armchairs and he actually said, I can't believe anyone would actually use this uh, as a chat up line. But he said, looking at you is like looking at a piece of meat in a butcher's window that you can't afford. And he just jumped on me and started kind of slobbering all over my neck. And the weirdest thing was two quite severely depressed patients got out of bed and came out of their, their rooms and got him off me. And I like to tell that story to people because people just have such a kind of stereotypical idea of psychiatric patients. It's not nearly so bad again now. Things have really changed. But in my day, people just thought anybody who was in a psychiatric hospital was by definition a dangerous killer. And so to tell mm. someone I had to get two people who were being treated in a psychiatric hospital to rescue me from a male nurse. I kind of felt that was a really big deal. So sorry that wasn't all completely comedy, guys, but, you know, I hope it kind of, it, it sort of mixed a picture of, of women nursing and comedy a bit. Joe Brown, everybody, thank you so much. Our first guest today is an independent science journalist and the author of three books, including Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong, and Superior, The Return of Race Science. She presents radio and TV programs on the BBC, and her writing has appeared in the Sunday Times, Nature, 
New Scientist, National Geographic and Wired. She's currently working on her fourth book on the origins of patriarchy. Please welcome Angela Saini. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Angela. What a Hello. joy to have you. And what Thank an you. impressive CV you have. So <laughs> but I'm not a doctor, to though. Get into it. I'm still quite gutted well, about that. Well, I mean, I'm not a doctor either, but I think someone offered me one of those honorary doctorates. And I'm definitely going to make people call me doctor all the time. They, they should probably call me honorary doctor. Um, so our first guest is joined by our second guest, the UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and former Chief Medical Officer for England. In the 2020 New Year's Honours, she became the second woman and the first outside the royal family to be appointed Dame Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath, GCB, for services to public health and research. She has also been awarded more than 30 honorary doctorate degrees. So she's honorary <laughs> doctor times 30. I dream of the day. Please welcome Dame Sally Davies. Woo! <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hello, Dame Sally. Thank you for joining us. Well, I... your CV is glittering, I would say. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, it's quite good when I look back at it, but I didn't set out to do that. It just kind of happened. I don't believe that. I'm not saying you didn't set out to do it, but I'm saying it didn't just happen. There's a lot of hard work there. Uh, you may not have set out to have got a pink sash from the Queen. But yeah, you you have you've <laughs> clearly done a lot of work. You haven't you didn't fall out of bed onto it either. Um, so we are talking to you today about women in medicine. And Angela, your first book seems like a great place to start. Inferior: How Science Got Women Wrong. Can you tell us a little bit about what's in that? Well, I had just given birth to my son, and. Um, my background is in engineering, so I used to write about engineering and physical sciences. But when I went back to work, and I'm sure lots of people can empathize with this, I had to take what I could get. And an editor said to me, can you write a story on the menopause? Which was something I knew nothing about, you know, either academically or through personal experience. But I had to say yes, because I needed the work. And yeah. um, just coincidentally, at that time, a paper had been published in Canada by three male scientists arguing that the reason that evolutionary reason that women experience the menopause might be because right throughout evolutionary history, so right throughout human history from the beginning, men did not find older women attractive enough to have sex with them, no man of any age. And um, this was weird because uh, there was a counter theory, in fact, the prevailing counter theory that said that the reason that women live so long into their infertile years, which is a more accurate way of thinking about the menopause, because most animals around the world die around the same time that they lose fertility. And this grandmother hypothesis states that the reason that women experience the menopause and live so long is because they're just so useful to their kids and their grandkids. They help keep them alive. And a lot of women have worked on this theory. Now, I had been trained up in a system that said that science is objective, it's rational, that whatever ideas we have about the world are through empirical observation. And I couldn't understand then why men and women were coming up with different theories about this same thing. And of course, there is bias mm -hmm. there. There is, you know, we're, we're affected by not just what we're taught and what we think about the world, but also what we want to be true. And that's where Inferior came off. It's really an investigation into how scientists think about women's minds and bodies and why they think about us that way and all the mistakes that they've made through history and how those mistakes have slowly been corrected. And what did you discover about menopause? Do we know why? <laughs> well, I don't think we'll ever know why, because when we're talking about why we are the way we are, what is human nature and evolutionary history, we'll never know unless we get a time machine and go back and and see it for ourselves, which will never happen. But the grandmother hypothesis is the one with the most data and um, rationale behind it. And certainly, if you look at the data, we can see through studies and observations around the world that the presence of a grandmother does increase the lifespan of her children and grandchildren. So there is an evolutionary mechanism, at least there. There's a possibility that that could be true. So that's the one I'm sticking with now. Rather than the other. I'm, I'm a slightly disappointed that the only reason I'm going to live beyond menopause is to care for children. <laughs> I feel like I, I want it to be more feminist than that. I want it to be 
because elderly women are meant to come together and take leadership and one day take over the world. I want it to, I want it to be well, more than that. Also, you can have that. I'm, I'm not going to have mean, anything's possible. Okay. Yeah. All right, In, great. When we're talking Good about question. evolutionary biology and, ev- you know, evolutionary theory, you can come up with whichever theory you like. You can work on that if you like. But yeah, I, I think I this like, has always like. been the case through history that women have been looked at in a certain way, haven't they? For example, if you look at, at Roman times, women's private bits were called pudenda, which means things to be ashamed of. And <laughs> also, if we were hysterical, that meant our womb was off wandering around our body. Although white couldn't go down the shops and get us something useful, I don't know. But um, no. so I think from that from that time... You know, women have always been viewed in in a certain way. And I've never thought that in some ways, maybe the core part of science is objective, but science is very much guided by who you are and what the sort of, I love this word and people find it annoying, but what the current paradigm is in terms of how people view particular scientific theories. So it's never totally objective, is it? Mm -hmm. No, but I think mm. scientists like I to know. pretend that they are or imagine that they are, not least because it makes them feel authoritative and more important <laughs> than everybody else. For sure. Um, Sally, you went from being a doctor to being in public health, so a role like Chris Whitty. How was that? How, is, how does it go from being a doctor to somebody who has to comment on the health and the health practices and guide a whole nation's health? Well, it is quite scary all the way through, actually, because so many different things come. Uh, my strength is in being able to interrogate people, the literature. Angela and I share that. We look at the literature and to assimilate it and then come to a view. And the difference is you're going from an individual in front of you. And so the balance shifts because you're thinking about populations. But everyone wants to help. And we're all born with brains. And as I say, you learn about it. People give advice and you come to a conclusion. For me, the biggest journey was to learn about the health impacts of deprivation. I knew from my work in Brent, I was a doctor working on sickle cell, about how difficult it was. But I hadn't understood the broader side of deprivation's impact on health. And if you look now at the fact that we're having one of the worst outcomes in terms of death per population from COVID, Mm. it is related to deprivation. And I I got there, but it took me a year or two to learn that and understand it. So you've got to look at the sort of societal factors that might make up a health crisis. Um, What do you think is one of the greatest global health. Now we've had this global health challenge. I think it's made us acutely aware we are one species, all this sort of trying to put up borders and keep these people out and, you know, prioritise us or whatever. We're one species. The virus doesn't care what our flag is, what football team we support, whether or not we're trying to put up borders to keep refugees out. The virus is the virus and it, it sees us all as human beings. What's one of the greatest global health challenges for the future, do you think? I think it is. We work as a globe and how are we fair to all parts of it. And that plays out through COVID. You know, we are not safe until the rest of the world is vaccinated. But of course, the um, slow pandemic that I've been working on for the last seven years is the resistance of bugs, whether they're bacteria, viruses, or parasites, Mm -hmm. to antibiotics. And we call that antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. We've already got 700,000 people a year dying of that. And yet we don't talk about it. So I think it's a bit like a lobster. COVID was the lobster dropped into boiling water and it's making a racket and it's dying quickly. Antimicrobial resistance is the lobster put into cold water and it's slowly heating up. Bits are dying and it will die. But no one notices because it's so slow. We're all used to seeing things that happen so slowly. You don't notice. And that's, you know, you don't, I don't notice that I'm getting older until I look at myself in a mirror and then look at a photograph or something, because it happens so very gradually. I'm incredibly jealous of you, Sally, because every single day I'm like, I feel that's a new wrinkle. And I think that's, <laughs> I would love to have that. That's probably lack of vanity on your part. Ones, so they're all right. Mm, Can I just ask Sally please. something? A couple of things. First yeah. of all, 
if what we know about COVID-19 at the moment is a 12-hour clock, how far round that clock are we? How much more do we need to know? Are we like two o'clock, six o'clock? Um, I think we've got to go another round. Um, we've oh. got to um, see what the variants do. We've got to um, be able to produce vaccines against these variants, and we've got to share it all around the world. And at the moment, uh, many of the poorer countries, what we call low and middle income countries, are really struggling. They don't have enough oxygen. They don't have um, the supplies they need of vaccines. And they are like us, building up waiting lists of people with other illnesses that need handling, because otherwise they'll have a lot of illness and death because of them. If GPs prescribed less antibiotics, would that sort some of the antimicrobial issue out? It would. Um, though they're doing well in this country, we've persuaded them to reduce by, I think it's uh, 5% over the last about five years. But we still know that too many prescriptions are dispensed. And it's not all GP's fault. Uh, they don't have access to rapid tests to judge whether it's a bacteria or not. Patients are demanding it. So we need to work to, to teach the public to wash hands and prevent infections and to understand that viruses don't respond to antibiotics and help the GPs protect antibiotics. Angela, I just want to throw to you because something Sally said there was very interesting that Inequality means that while wealthy countries might get on top of the virus, we are all one species with one globe. And unless we help poorer countries that are often poorer because of colonization, etc., we're not going to fix it because we're letting countries, again, because of inequality, hang out to dry. But also, we know that more Black, Asian and ethnic minority people in this country and other Western countries have died of COVID than white people. You mm -hmm. wrote a book called Superior, The Return of Race Science. Um, could you speak to this a little bit? Oh, it was my biggest bugbear last year. It's all I've been working on for the last year is trying to shift these narratives around race and COVID. So it was around March, April. Coincidentally, just a couple of months after uh, the British Medical Journal released a special issue on race in the NHS, race in medicine, showing the extent of racism, not just um, against patients, but also that staff within the NHS experience. So this is real. It's not just an issue in the United States. It's also, mm. also a problem in the UK. Um, but when the stats became clear that people of ethnic minority backgrounds, particularly Asian doctors at the beginning in London, were dying at much greater rates than everybody else, I saw prominent medical professionals, some physicians, start speculating about the possibility that there could be a genetic reason for this that there were there were some genes that we non-white people have that make us more likely to die of covid than everybody else and um i was shocked because we have always known that there are racial disparities in health in the uk and in the us where we were seeing the same problems last year why would we not expect them to play out in the event of a pandemic of course they were going to so in the us for instance black americans die of almost everything at greater rates than white americans including infant mortality so that risk starts mm. from the second in, that in childbirth. Yeah, white people well, used to die in childbirth all well, the time, and but then, the rate, and then, yeah, but, the but, rates are but science stepped in and fixed that. But black patients well, are not given the same care and treatment, and don't have the same yeah. access to resources. Well, that's an aspect of it. There are other issues. There are demographic issues. There are structural issues that mean that, like Sally said, one of the big reasons for health disparities is socioeconomic status and deprivation. And mm. um, this overlaps with race. So very often, if you are an ethnic minority, you're more likely to have a poorer diet or live in a more toxic area or a more toxic environment, particularly in the US. So why did we not expect those social factors to also play out, those environmental factors to also play out when the pandemic started? And it was very tough to change that narrative. Um, I remember writing a piece for The Lancet. I wrote an essay for The Lancet in the summer trying to get doctors to understand that they need to not focus on genetics when they're trying to understand racial disparities mm -hmm. around COVID. And the Lancet, the Lancet was so resistant 
to what I was writing. And mm. I wasn't writing anything that went beyond the literature. It was all within the literature mm. and quite well established that um, essays aren't usually peer-reviewed. They peer-reviewed mine twice. And then even mm. after that, there were doctors who were resistant. But do you know what really changed the conversation was the George Floyd murder. After that murder, and mm. we were all having this global conversation around racism, suddenly the Lancet invited me onto their COVID-19 commission and suddenly I was getting contacted by doctors and patients and lots of people saying, yes, you're right. We researchers have been looking at the wrong things here. Maybe we need to look at the social determinants of health more. And that's what I've been working on for the last six months. Angela, you use the word social determinants. And I think part of our problem is people talk about determinants and that's passive. You're accepting them. So I published a book mm -hmm. in November and I argue that it's time we talked about drivers, social drivers, commercial drivers, and took control and changed them. So can I ask you to change your language and frame it differently? <laughs> because people are too passive about it. We've got to do something about it. Yeah, I completely agree mm. with you. And I do think language matters here. Um, the problem is the language changes all the time and we're always arguing over all the language that we use. So, for example, even the phrase BAME, BAME, is so heavily contested and it's very difficult to use because mm. it's used in you know research and literature and then you feel very uncomfortable using it out there in the real world because people, you know, some people don't like that term and don't identify with it. It's really tough. Mm-hmm. Mm Yes, I understand that very much so. But I think drivers is a better word than determinants because, as you say, Sally, determinants means, oh, something's determining it. Drivers means if poverty is driving this, we got to stop poverty because it's driving deaths. Yes. As opposed to poverty is a determinant, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, well, we drive the car in the other direction. So that's, that's a great piece of language. We're always looking for language to change, to create, because language creates thought, you know, and it creates the way that we approach things. Um, I mean, I, I do Joe, think one of the issues is having a conversation about it and being comfortable because, as you said, Angela, there is still so much that stops people. And I, I think on, on the one side you've got kind of white liberals who are tiptoeing around, worrying that they're going to offend people, and they hear that a lot of people don't like the term BAME, so they don't know what to say. And I think if we can't actually just talk honestly about it amongst all of ourselves, I don't really know that, you know, it's going to move on from that. I mean, when I was a, a, a nurse at the Maudsley in Camberwell, I belonged to a group called the British Transcultural Psychiatry Group, which obviously sounds a bit kind of odd in itself. <laughs> but what we were trying to look at uh, was why, um, for example, five to six times as many Afro-Caribbean men were diagnosed as having schizophrenia as their kind of white counterparts, you know. And there were kind of lots of different theories and a lot of anger and a lot of resentment. And I remember kind of going to a conference and just getting up and saying, look, people don't even know how to talk about this without other people in the group kind of getting angry. And I, I don't know how you get around that. Do you just agree? I think we need to agree more on how to talk about it. And then we can talk about it without people arguing about the fact that we're talking about it in the wrong way. The thing is, whatever words that you use to describe race are always going to be inadequate because, like Deborah said, we are one species. And these categories that we have come up with over the last few hundred years are arbitrary. They've always been arbitrary and they're yeah. always shifting. The boundaries of these categories are always shifting. And that's why we struggle with them. You know, that's why we struggle to mm -hmm. place people in boxes, why we struggle to place ourselves in boxes. I struggle with the language too. It doesn't really mean that much. And for me, especially when I was writing Superior, it was I wrote it for myself really. It was a very cathartic experience because I've struggled with my identity as someone you know, I grew up in a very racist part of Southeast London and I've struggled with it my entire life. And what I realized at the end was that my identity doesn't actually belong to me. It belongs to wherever I happen to be in the world and it belongs to people looking at me and deciding what I am. Okay. I don't get to decide it, sadly, uh, but none of us do because it's always been like that. It's always been a shifting quantity. You know, in the 18th century, I would be 
categorized as Caucasian because Caucasian under the original Blumenbach definition was everyone from North India to Western Europe. And now it's the word that we used to politely describe white people. You know, yeah. I am sometimes mm. categorized as black because in anti-racism movements when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, if you were not white, then you were politically black. So my yeah. union, mm -hmm. the NUJ, still calls me a black member. So I'm at the same time, depending on your perspective, white, brown or black. And that's a nonsense mm -hmm. of these categories. And that's yeah. why it's so difficult. That's why we still fight over them. So if inequality is a driver, then mm -hmm. black and brown people will suffer. Sally, you're the special envoy for AMR, yes? Can you tell us what that means? Well, I realised seven years ago that infections were getting out of control in this way and that um, when I was a young doctor and Joe was nursing, if someone got an infant it was resistant, you just opened the cupboard and got another antibiotic out because we had a whole cupboard full. Mm. But mine's empty. So this is a worse and worse problem. It's particularly bad in poor countries. Uh, so there is an outbreak at the moment of di bacterial diarrhea, which started in Hyderabad and moved up to uh, Pakistan. And instead of 4% of children dying because of antibiotic resistance, 40% of children are dying. And this shouldn't be allowed oh my to happen. God. So what we're doing is, well, what happened was I said to the government, right, I'm, I'm moving on from being chief of medical officer. Chris Whitty will be just perfect if COVID happens. You know, you've got the right guy there. And I'm going to be master at Trinity College. I don't want the nation to give up trying to sort this out, both nationally and globally. Will you let me have this title and go on on behalf of the nation? And, you know, really geeing things up at the World Health Organization. So I was allowed to have this title and we work. I work with government on the G7 and how we respond, and it's things like transparency of drug supply. I bet you know where your food from and you could find out where your clothes come from. You don't know where your drugs came from, and you don't know if actually the drug the doctor wanted to give you wasn't available, which it often isn't, so they just substituted something else because it's not transparent, except in New Zealand, interestingly. But across the rest of the world, it's not transparent. So we're asking for transparent. We're asking for new ways to do the research and pull through new drugs. So in New Zealand, you can find out where your drugs have come from the same way you can say, well, I wouldn't buy this dress because yep. I know it was made in a sweatshop. I'll buy this one because I know it's ethical. And But New Zealand's the only country in the world. Jacinda Ardern yep. does run a lovely shop there, doesn't she? It's, <laughs> New Zealand is getting more and more and more uh, a, a, a destination to live in every single well, The last thing she wants is... Um, well, there's another feminist. But I think it was there before she started. But uh, yes, you can go into the... <laughs> drug regulator uh, website but you can and say, you can I, see but where can they come from what like i know what like, with fashion whether it's fast fashion or sustainable fashion i know with food you know is this battery hens or you know have these hens been treated well and as is is my food's being filled with uh things i don't want them to be filled with i have no idea what question would i ask for drugs they all come from a lab don't they i don't understand well, what what's yes, the question but, um we can talk about pigs and chickens, as of course, more than 70% of antibiotics go into them, not to treat illness, but to make them grow faster. And maybe a conversation for later. Where do our drugs... Is that another reason why we're becoming resistant to antibiotics? It's not good, the food chain, <laughs> yes, because they <laughs> breed in intensive farming, not in Europe. The countries, the intensive farming with growth-promoting antibiotics promotes antibiotic-resistant bugs that can then be transmitted to humans or into waterways or whatever. But our drugs... The, the we should all become vegans, shouldn't we, really, Sally? Should well, we all become no, vegans? because I want you to have a bit of animal protein. But uh, we should uh, eat uh, a lot more plant-based. Uh, absolutely, yes. But um, ha have some B12 so you don't get anemic. So where okay, do your drugs come Vegans from? will tell you you can, but I'm not vegan, so I, I shouldn't say... Oh, because uh, I'm just a massive hypocrite. Um, uh, but yes, where do your drugs come from? So the active uh, ingredients generally come from China and India, and then they're put together to make the drugs mainly in India, 
some in the West and some in the States, but predominantly in India, all the generics and everything. And in making them, they push many of those um, companies, masses of the drugs into their outflow into the water system. So that's very bad too. So um, we're trying to... Do you mean the waste? Yes. Okay. Hey, Deborah, is this is this really cheering you up? It's really cheering me up. <laughs> yeah, it's not a comedy, is it? <laughs> no, no it's not really. But I want to know about her. I know. I totally sure, agree. Sir. But I think the thing is, what's so scary about it is it's kind of everywhere. You know, animals are being brought yeah. up and having all sorts of things pumped into them. They're fed. They're fed <laughs> soya because it's cheap. La 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 la. You know. And everyone's excreting everything into into kind of rivers and then that's all, you know, into the water supply. And the problem with that is you almost feel that there isn't anywhere you can get something that's unadulterated anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we haven't even mentioned the drug companies making profits as well and, um, you know, selling kind of branded stuff and it not being available to certain groups because they can't afford it. It's just... I mean, it, you know, I know this is supposed to be a bit of comedy tonight, but it is extremely depressing, really, um, when you get the clash of kind of big business versus people's health. And if you look at, yeah. oh, you, totally. know, you know, totally. if you look well, at Sally, America. What can we do about it? Yeah, what well, can we do about have we, it? Have we, got any, have we got any solutions? Let's think positively. Sally, you're on this. How can we help? What, what are you doing? Is, can we help? What are you doing that we can get behind? Well, I do think that's a bit much to put on to Sally. <laughs> no, <laughs> Sally, I want Sally to fix it so <laughs> okay. single-handedly. And I'm offering to help. <laughs> I want to know how big the problem is around the world, and I want patients to be able to find out what bug they've got and whether there's resistance. That's supporting our poor world and helping everyone. I want uh, limits on what can be put into the environment. I want transparency. I, th I want new drugs, and that will mean new ways of funding the drugs. Because actually, the reason we don't have new drugs is the pharmaceutical companies don't make profits out of them. They have been made to sell them so cheap, mm. they've stopped researching them. So we've got a really fun uh, system in Britain. We're piloting, paying them a certain amount of money, but doctors can use it as they want. And we're valuing the antibiotic by its value, not visual patient like cancer drugs, but to all of our society in Britain. And we're going to see whether that allows us to help get new drugs. Could we no help wonder just you've got a special sash from the Queen that no other woman <laughs> outside the royal family's ever had with what you're doing. Angela, what were you saying think, there? Well, do you know, I feel like I've done my part here because I have not to put anybody off, thankfully we're not in person, but I have recurrent strep throat, so I get strep quite often. And a few years ago, I decided to stop taking antibiotics for it, and now I just fight it off myself. And I find myself fighting it off every time I feel it in my throat. I find myself fighting it off. Mm. So I feel I have done my bit for antimicrobial drug Resistance. Well done. Yes, <laughs> yeah. we need people washing their hands, not Where's taking my pink antibiotics sash? unless they need them. <laughs> and then we need to <laughs> all this other stuff. <laughs> Sally, could you have a, a little word with Her Majesty and tell <laughs> her what Angela has done to not take antibiotics for her sore throat and see if she could rustle up a CBE or an OBE or something? <laughs> it would be a good one, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. When, when, so, when her yeah. What did you get it for? I, I haven't taken antibiotics for years. <laughs> and uh, I'm friends with a very good friend of Her Majesty. <laughs> and she heard about that. And I got a cheeky OBE. Um, it'd be great if there was something called a cheeky OBE, which is a sort of slightly off kilter uh, reason for getting an OBE. Um, <laughs> Angela, is there any work that you've done in any of your books that speaks to this area of um, COVID, of viruses, the, the future. What do you see for us for the future? Sally does this wonderful work kind of at a research level. And my job as a journalist is really to broaden it out. And I think a lot of the way that we think about human difference and the reasons why things affect some people more than others or why some people, for example, I'm allergic to penicillin. I can't take penicillin. So this 
problem is particularly acute for me because there are certain mm -hmm. drugs that I can't take. And we are all so different at an individual level like that. I worry sometimes that I've noticed this tendency over the last couple of years to essentialize about groups, large groups, whether that's women or whether it's different ethnic groups, and assume that everyone within that group is very similar medically. And actually, we're so different. Most of the difference is at that individual level. And it's very difficult for doctors or researchers to study at that level because, you know, how do you do that? How do you tailor medicines for 7 billion different people? It's just, it's mm. impossible. But I think we need to try and get an understanding of how we are each different rather than thinking so much about group difference because it really can lead you down false paths. We see that with race and medicine. But even with women, you know, there has been this idea that this orthodoxy that I've been wrote about in Inferior because it was so prevalent and so well established that women suffer different heart attack symptoms from men. But then in 2019, after so this was a couple of years after Inferior came out, the British Heart Foundation funded a study at the University of Edinburgh looking at this properly and, and they found that actually women are just as likely to experience typical heart attack symptoms as men. But one of the reasons that they're not diagnosed is because of sexism because we expect men to have heart attacks and women not to have heart attacks. So it's not a difference in our bodies necessarily. It's a difference in the way that we treat each other based on stereotypes and assumptions that we have. So that kind of delicate balance between understanding what causes the differences that we see in the individuals that we see it, I think we have to get a grip of that. Can I just ask both of you, One why minute. do you think that women live longer than men in general? Well, again, it's on average. It's not, you know, for instance, women have on average slightly stronger immune systems than men. But I know that I don't. I get every, mm. every bug that comes through our house, I will catch it. When my son started school, I caught everything. And my husband never gets sick at all. And so we have to remember, even if there are statistical level Trends. differences between mm. large groups of people, that doesn't really tell you anything about one particular patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could get your husband to oh, take more oh, antibiotics. Oh, that might even score <laughs> out a bit, maybe. I don't know. Well, Just you know, his family both doctors. He's not they going to get an OBE. Him with antibiotics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sally, why do women live longer than men as a trend? I think they have slightly longer telomeres. So it, it is a genetic, presumably, because we have two X chromosomes as well. I've never okay. read it up. But I'm busy okay, handling so the fact we do. And the fact uh, now then, we do know why people in our most deprived communities um, live with double the years of multimorbidity, so ill health, um, of those in our least deprived. So, you know, the uh, privation, the, um, all the illnesses that get, whether they're cardiovascular, diabetic or cancer, they are currently and the outcomes are worse. And these, so they live less long, but they live longer with ill health. And that's abominable that our society mm. accepts that and doesn't do something about it. We did yeah. a piece of work to a couple of years ago. Not determinants. Yeah, we showed that 10,000 people would be uh, live for an extra five years if only the most deprived got the same standard of care as the least deprived. I mean, imagine that. Yeah, and actually that wow. life expectancy gap between the rich and the poor in Britain has been getting bigger over the last 10 yep. years. It's got worse. People take notice of what's measured the government to develop a composite health index alongside the GDP. And I'm really excited because at the beginning of December, they published a national health index from the Office of National Statistics for con um, consultation, and we're going to get one. And they counted 20 just because they had the data as 100%, and it's dropped. That's horrible news, but it shows it's picking stuff up. So that's mm. a really exciting thing. What gets measured gets managed and done. Yeah. Mm. Well, I have faith that while you are driving, uh, that, that things are going to change because your energy is absolutely incredible. Um, is there anything you, before we throw to audience questions, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say that you would like our audience to know about women in medicine, about COVID, about your specialty, 
Uh, well, I think I'd say about women in medicine that we now have more than 50% of the medical students are women, mm. and you can do anything. When I came in, there was a glass ceiling for it. Enjoy and let it take you where, where you want to go. Great. So come into medicine. Uh, women are the majority now. There's a majority of doctors are women now in this country. And you think when Elizabeth Garrett, what Elizabeth Garrett Anderson had to do yeah. to get, I mean, it's unbelievable what she had to do. If anybody doesn't know, no one would accept her at a medical school. She had to find a medical school with a loophole where they had forgotten to say in their charter, no women, because they thought it was like saying no zebras. It's just no point saying it, yeah. it's obvious. And so she got in there. Then she got a, a license, but she didn't have a full medical degree. She learned French well enough to go to the Sorbonne, who were accepting women. Imagine learning French well enough to go and study medicine in French. When she came back, no one would give her a job. And so she's had to set up her own clinic, and then no one would come. And then she just got really lucky with an outbreak of cholera. Well done. Well done, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. <laughs> People so desperate that they went. And oh, it turns out she was, she was great. But the reason she's a feminist is she then set up a school so other women didn't have to go through what she did. She's the reason we have over 50% female doctors in this country today. And it's something to be remembered, to not make yourself the exception, but to invite others in. Angela, is there anything you would like to say that you haven't you said know, yet before we go to questions? Well, that story about Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, it's not a claim to fame in my own family, but my husband's family. His great aunt was the first dentist in India. She's still alive now. She's in her late oh, 90s. Wow. And we did go and see her for one of her birthdays a couple of years ago. And I'm very grateful that we got the chance to do that and take my son to meet her. But she was the most incredible woman. She never got married. She traveled the world as a dentist and made all these wonderful friends, other dentist women friends around the world, and still kept in contact with them. To this day, she's still corresponding with her friends around the world. Um, although she worked very hard throughout her life, it was only near the end that people started to realize, wow, this is what you did. You did something quite amazing. You traveled the world by ship and did these incredible things. Absolutely. And now she's being remembered. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That's really, really wonderful. Anything to plug or you want us to do or tell us about, Angela? Uh, we should all buy your books, especially Inferior and Superior, both of which are completely fascinating. Any, anywhere else we can see you, follow you on Twitter? Anything else we should know um, about? Well, I do have a website, but I want to urge everybody actually to, um, there's a wonderful lab at Harvard run by a woman called Sarah Richardson called the Gender Sci Lab. That's all one word. So if you type that into Google, um, and if you want to kind of uh, get on top of gender and sex difference and how to think about it in a more nuanced and careful way. I think that's a brilliant place to start. And they have some really good articles also about sex differences and COVID and why we need to be careful before we start essentializing groups of people when we think about mm. these things. Sally, is there anything you want us to do other than not take antibiotics? <clears throat> Unless we just take vaccinations. Them. I think I'll go for that one. Not only uh, the routine ones of childhood and old age, but actually these ones that we've got now for COVID are proven to be extraordinarily safe. Though I had a bit of a sore shoulder for three days after my first, but hey, it's worth it for the uh, advantage against mm. that virus that it gives us. Herd immunity doesn't work unless the herd gets immunized. Uh, please, please, please get your <laughs> vaccination. I think we're preaching to the choir, let's be honest, on the guilty feminist science museum live stream and it's like i don't i don't think there's anyone on this who's going mm, i'm gonna wait and see how it goes uh joe brand is there anything you came to say or would like to tell us about or anywhere we can follow you or anything we can do for you <clears throat> no just leave me alone um but um <laughs> <laughs> what i really what i really would like to say is i think you know we're still on the bridge between being members of society who had absolutely no power whatsoever and having parity with men. We're still crossing that bridge. And I just want to say that I hugely admire women who somehow manage, and it is still going on very much so, huge percentages of women who not only manage their families, but also manage incredibly demanding jobs with not as much help as they should be getting. They're managing what they call the whole emotional load 
and that a lot of them are doing full-time jobs and now a lot of them are doing most of the homeschooling as well and that's why I think women are absolutely brilliant they're tough as old boots but they shouldn't need to be and they should get a bit more respect and a bit more money and a bit more help well a lot that's all I came to say <laughs> A lot more. And please, can we give the nurses more of a pay rise than 1%? For God's sake, after everything they've been no, through with COVID, really. 1% is an insult, is an insult, absolute insult. Um, so get your vaccination. Remember, it's International Women's Day. So remember to appreciate the women that have come before us that fought for the enclave and to fight for the inclusion of the women around us and to come. And do think of those other intersections of diversity and especially inequality, as we've been talking about today, as a factor of literal life and death. Um, have we got some questions from the audience? Uh, Nicola Croft says, what are the main obstacles for women in medicine at present? How have they changed over the last 10 years? I think a lot of the obstacles are in the women themselves. We have to want to do it. And we have to, uh, when we have children, choose partners who want us to do it too. I guess it goes for every profession. But you can't have it all on your own or you really are stuck. So you need partners who uh, recognize women have rights to careers, who support you, and then you have to get on with it. And you have to believe that you're the equal of all those other men, whatever they think or say. And I also think that the way we structure things needs to be, uh, we need to understand society, parents need to raise the next generation. So the way things are structured can't be for the 1950s, where the man goes out and earns the money and the woman stays home all the time. We need to rethink and restructure. Um, Alexandra Newton says, I lead science at a primary school in London. How can I target girls and children from disadvantaged backgrounds to boost interest and confidence? How did the panel know that science was for you? Uh, how did you know science was for you, Angela? Well, I was quite lucky that um, I grew up in a really egalitarian family. My dad was an engineer and I never had any sense that there was anything that I couldn't do or that there were toys that I shouldn't play with or anything like that. I think one of the most important things we can do is give children all the same toys and a wide range of toys um, because these, you know, depending on what you play with really does exercise the parts of your brain and the skills that you need to develop to do what you need to do. I loved Meccano when I was growing up. I absolutely was obsessed with it. Whether that's mm. why I became an engineer or not, I don't know. But certainly as I grew older, I started tinkering with things, fixing things. Um, I do all the DIY at home now instantly <laughs> because I, I know how to. I know how to fix stuff. And that's because my mum and dad taught me. And simple things like that. We don't need to kind of have big role models or, you know, big inspirational stories. Just as simple as getting girls to do the same things that boys are doing is... Um, mm. You not get giving girls there. a nurse's costume and boys a, a doctor's <laughs> costume. Um, but giving both to both. Both nurses and doctors are equally important yeah. and we need more male nurses as well. Yeah. Jo, how did you know that you wanted to do such a sciencey degree as nursing? Well, I think it was probably through my mum because my mum was just not like other people's mums. She wasn't, you know, I, I, I kind of born in 1950 and at school I can remember a lot of girls sort of, talking about their mums just doing very mumsy things at home. Mm -hmm. Where it was my mum was just never like that. You know, I remember one day going into school, it was probably about eight or nine, and we were talking about what you what were you all talking about yesterday when you were having your tea and someone was saying, Well my mum was talking about a dress she was making, la la la. And I said, Well we were talking about if you had a gun during the Second World War <laughs> and you had the chance, <laughs> would you shoot Hitler? And um, they were kind of like, what, your mum was talking about stuff like that? You know, and I think that's why, because my mum was the sort of person that just wasn't mummy-ish at the time. You when do anything. When, yeah, absolutely, she really was. So I'm going to do a couple of quick fire questions now, uh, just so we get more people's questions asked. Uh, Philippa Katnak says, how have women's bodies, often without consent, advanced medicine? Well, I think all our bodies have advanced medicine through the learning of individuals by working with patients 
And uh, actually, women's bodies have not advanced into the as much as men. The things I find very mm. irritating is that most clinical trials have more men in them than women, and they usually mm. don't have pregnant women. Uh, they say for safety, but you know we're now having to do all the vaccine trials again in pregnant women. Mm. They don't usually have old people either. So women need to be more there. Excellent answer. Somebody asked how to feel confident returning to the profession after a break in practice due to maternity leave or other circumstances. How do you feel confident coming back in? Has anybody here had a baby or taken a break for another reason and then gone back in? I have. And I think the answer to feeling confident is pretending you're confident. Yes. And that when, <laughs> yes. when, I, was, when I was sitting there getting, not sitting, standing there, getting some of the most appalling heckling that you could ever believe from these repulsive drunken men some nights, I would just look at them like I could not give less of a toss. And once you start doing that, they actually genuinely believe you don't care. And once they believe that, you've won. And, you know, and I think that's half the battle. If you don't look worried about it, you don't look nervous, you don't look um, subservient, act that you don't, mm. and then eventually mm. you won't be. And also don't feel guilt. I think a lot of women who go back to work after having kids feel guilty about leaving their kids with someone else. But we have to remember that right through human history, children have not just been raised by mothers, they've been raised by communities. And it's good for children to have those mm. communities. And in fact, that was a lesson I got from my mother-in-law because she did a lot of babysitting for me when I went back to work. And she never, she was a doctor herself. She'd just retired and she never let me feel guilty about going to work. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm. It takes a village. Well, she probably knew that the only reason she was still alive was to take care of the grandchildren. <laughs> uh, that was the very reason wow. that, that, that she'd been allowed to live post-menopause. She understood the purpose. Um, <laughs> thank you so very much for joining us. Angela Saini. Oh, Woo! thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much for joining us, Dame Sally. Woo! And the Thank wonderful you. Joe Brand. Yay! Um, throughout 2021, the Science Museum Group is hosting a series of climate talks, panel discussions, Q&As, and events connecting you with leaders, experts, activists, and campaigners as they discuss how to tackle the problems facing our communities due to climate change. Tune in if this affects you, by which I mean you enjoy living on planet Earth. For more information <laughs> and how to book, look on the Science Museum's website. And uh, now it only falls for me to say thank you so much for coming to the Guilty Feminist a Science Museum live stream. Thank you so much to the Science Museum for having us. Everyone has worked so hard behind the scenes to make this happen. I've been Deborah Francis White. You've all been wonderful. Good night. something you know the red rose club that you just talked about yeah that's where i met my husband oh really yeah where you were told could you just go around and do the glasses after you'd done your brilliant comedy comparing that's was that your husband, husband? Were it not for the red rose it, what, hopefully it wasn't my husband who said that to you <laughs> i like to think it wasn't but also i did think when you told that story of being overboard and